Welcome to The Artist Politic. Today we talk with Left at London. She's a social media creator and musician. We talk about helping others through love songs, the intersection of social media and music, and embracing her position as a role model. So, Nat Puff. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thanks. <laughs> so, you are better known on the internet as Left at London. I'm better known a lot of places as Left at London. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and you got your start on the now defunct platform Vine. Rest in peace. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what, you know, people can find your, your Vines, you know. Uh, all over the place. Uh, they're awesome and hilarious. Uh, but what was it about that platform that spoke to you at, at the time? Like, why were you drawn to making content there? It had as short of an attention span as I did. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just six seconds. Uh, it's also kind of like, I really like the idea of Vine because it was like, it kind of constricts you. It, it kind of like, uh, like forces you to work with the constraints of the platform. What do you think it is that people identify with when, like where, where do your followers come from? Like, why are they drawn to you? Well, when it was on Vine, I'm not sure. I guess that was funny. Uh, when it was on Twitter, I grew a lot more of a like, because that my videos were starting to become musical with like the mashups and the how-to videos like I've gotten more like musical fans and then from then on it was easy to transition them into fans of my music because mm -hmm. I didn't like like I didn't release music on like available platforms other than SoundCloud um until June of 2018 mm. and that was like when I had like I want to say like 45,000 followers on Twitter, I think. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed since then. Now like people are like starting to like know me for my music. So we kind of glossed over really quick these, uh, you, you did this YouTube video about how to make a Tyler the Creator song. Well, it was just on Twitter. It um, was on Twitter, okay. Somebody must have re-uploaded it. Yeah, I saw, yep. That's what I'm, happens. I am, old and lame and so I saw it I saw the re-uploaded version on YouTube I mm. apologize <laughs> but I saw it I and I loved it this, I don't get any of that sweet YouTube monetization I know I know I'm sorry about that I'll I'll reimburse you for your uh, fraction of a penny oh, a little you later so much. Yeah. yeah yeah you owe me one small drop of water <laughs> <laughs> so but those how-to videos I think are such a great way for you to make that transition from the comedy vine <laughs> world to what I know you want to focus on, which is music, yeah. right? Um, but it seems like that perfect mashup where it's, it has that feel of those early vines, like the comedy is there and the quick cuts and everything. Yeah. But, but you're also through the comedy showing off that you, not showing off, but you're showing <laughs> that you have this deep musical knowledge and skill to even because not just anybody could pull off those those how-to videos. I do feel like one thing that was kind of hard about the how-to videos was like, I made the Take Keith one, which was the first one that I made, which like nobody fucking knows because it didn't get that much traction. Yeah. Um, so I made the Take Keith one. Uh, and then I made the Frank Ocean one. That one blew up. And um, like after that blew up, there was like sort of like a, like shit, I gotta follow this up. Mm -hmm. And that's when I did the Tyler the Creator one. Um, I actually made the Tyler the Creator beat the first beat, um, cause I did two beats on mm -hmm. that video. The first beat that I did, um, I actually made that like a couple of weeks after I made the Frank Ocean video, but I didn't make the rest of the video surrounding it until months later. Oh. Uh, so it's like, um, I just, 
felt like it wasn't time or that I wasn't just like passionate about it. Um, and like, that's like, that's one thing that I've been trying to do, like focus on the things that I'm passionate about, whether they're silly or serious. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do the lightning round? Let's fucking do this lightning round. Hell yeah. Okay. If you could wipe one social media platform off the internet, which would you choose? 4chan. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why I would say 4chan. That's a good one. Yeah. Who's the funniest tweeter? Oh my God. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the Twice Pussy crew. Uh, I'm in a group chat with a bunch of really funny Twitter people. Uh, Punish Picnic, Misandrism, uh, Julian Epp, uh, Oddstronaut, Tap Dancing Goat. Uh, he changed his at recently. Fuck, I can't remember what his new at is, but his name is Ethan. Uh, he's a lovely boy, and he just got a cat, and as did I. I got a cat yesterday. His name yes, is Mouse, and I love him. Awesome. Already, he, he, he snuggled up to me like last night in bed, and I was like, we're gonna be good friends. It was great. What's the best Nickelodeon cartoon? SpongeBob has to be the answer because people will try to like, I don't know, be cool and like try to pick out something like obscure or like something that people wouldn't say like I was trying to do for a second there, but mm -hmm. I was like, no, it's gonna be SpongeBob. There's a reason that show's a classic. Yeah, solid. Um, how often do you check your phone? Um, if my phone wasn't over there, I'd probably check it like three times during this interview. Yeah. <laughs> I am a chronic, I'm a chronic phone addict for sure, uh, which I'm trying to when I'm, I'm trying to stop that soon. Yeah, is yeah. that increasing over time or staying steady? Well, considering that my job kind of relies on like my social media presence a little yeah. bit, like because that my social media presence and my music are so intertwined, it's really hard to separate them. Okay, multiple choice. If you have to live in one of these places for a week, which would you choose? Outer space, a haunted house, underwater, or your home, but just like slightly uncomfortably warm? Outer space because I'd die the fastest and it would look the prettiest. <laughs> you don't, no follow-ups. Yeah, you look like you were like not prepared for that answer. How could I be? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> so, okay. So you've cited Kanye West, Frank Ocean as like some serious influences on, on your music. Mm -hmm. um, do you hesitate to keep Kanye on that list nowadays with his new political leanings and voice and all that? That's rough because like... <clears throat> My gut wants to like say like, you should probably drop him as an inspiration, but it's like the inspiration's already been like sort of like ingrained in me, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's like regardless of what he has done recently, his influence and inspiration is like going to be there regardless. Like I can't like remove that from myself. Right. Cause like, um, like a lot of people will talk about like how toxic cancel culture is. I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. Like, I think there are parts of like so-called cancel culture that like does affect real people, uh, in a negative way. Um, but I think the criticism that Kanye has gotten is very apt. I think what he's trying to do is like trying to do that, like, like preach that, like love everybody, um, like love everybody, even your enemies type thing. But he's doing it in such a poor way that like it's leaning on, like it's starting to like border on like genuine support. And that's where people are like get confused and worried um, because I think that what Kanye has done recently is like kind of grotesque and really disappointing but I can't remove his influence or like how important he was sort of like in my 
more recent song writings and like like songs that I've written starting in like 2017 I want to say like were he- heavily influenced by like the summer where I literally bought all of his albums and I just listened to them like back to back like mm. that was a huge like the way that he approached an album was like a huge inspiration for how I wanted to approach an album so it's like we've all been influenced by people who have done horrible horrible things we have all been positively influenced by people who have done horrible, shitty things. Mm-hmm. We, like, I mentioned Tarantino earlier. That man is kind of a creep. Right. Like, it's unfortunate, but he is. Also made some great movies. Both are true, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And, like, the only way to combat, if you really want to, like, look critically at media and like remove influence from like shitty people the only way that you can do that is lift up the voices of like marginalized musicians and filmmakers and what have you because they're often going to like 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 a lot of the times you'll find that like some of them still do shitty things. But one thing that bothers me is that marginalized artists such as like, I'm going to mention Kanye West again, Mm -hmm. um, will be completely like spat on and cast out while non marginalized folks that do the same things are like cautiously appreciated. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, David Lynch said a similar thing like a couple months after Kanye West and people still have like, I don't know, like Twin Peaks, Mm -hmm. uh, phone desktops. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that speaks some truth into the fact that like marginalized folks will be critiqued more for these things partially because that it's like like it's it's like a we trusted you type thing but another partially like another reason why is because it's like sometimes people naturally want a reason to distrust them anyway and if they can find a way to justify that then they'll go for it like 100 percent people should be held accountable equally but we should also figure out as a community of like of like leftists of like people involved in social justice we need to figure out what accountability looks like because right now we have like our system of judgment is very scattered Mm -hmm. and very confused and honest to god i think the best way to do it is if like a bunch of like people within the community got together and just like discussed like what their personal opinions are and instead and if somebody says something like a little bit off not like extremely off but just a little bit off and somebody says like "Mm, i don't know that sounds a bit like apologist for example Mm -hmm. like there's like um like 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 instead of going like you get out instead going like "Mm, i don't know about that let's think of something else i think that's like a very important thing to do because otherwise like we'll be so afraid of saying the wrong thing that we don't say anything and that nobody gets justice. That's no, right. Nobody is able to be held accountable. And like, that's what I see a lot of the times is that a lot of people are either not held accountable or like held to an extremely high standard. You have a healthy Twitter following at this point. Um, Def- define healthy. Lots of people. You got lots sure. of people sure. watching you, listening yeah. to you. You have an audience. Yeah. At your literally in your pocket, right? Yes. Um, are you ever? I, as far as I can tell, you you don't use that platform for to s- speak on things like this, the kind of political realm. Are you ever tempted to kind of flip that switch and use that platform for that kind of thing? Well. <clears throat> It's complex because I feel like a lot of my fan base are 
marginalized folks, uh, mostly trans, mostly trans or gay or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And most of me wants to like be this person who just shares music and comedy because I want a place that people can just sit and relax. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of marginalized folks have that. Mm -hmm. To see me, a trans woman, thriving in the industry, whether that is like a couple hundred like listens on Spotify or a couple hundred thousand, whatever that is, I consider that thriving. Mm -hmm. And if anybody can see someone like them in any capacity thriving that it's somewhat of a relief even though that my songs can be sad and like depressing at points people still like listening to them uh like marginalized folks still like listening to them yeah. because that they feel like like this is a story that we don't often get to tell about ourselves we don't often get to experience joy or sadness or pain or elation outside of our transness. Mm. Like we're, we just don't see that represented. Yeah. And like, like sure, being trans affects a lot of my life, but it doesn't affect all my life. There are some moments of my life where it's just, it's just a thing that I am. Yeah. And it's on the sidelines. Honestly, being a lesbian affects me way more than being a trans woman. How so? I'm a slut. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're a lesbian slut, you talk to girls mostly. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, let's talk about some music. Oh, so that, you have... <laughs> that'd probably be good. I am a musician after you all. You are. <laughs> so you have these two EPs. They're, they're out. Um, yes, the Purple Heart EP in Transgender Street Legend Volume 1. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, they're both excellent, and they're both maybe a little too short. <laughs> maybe they're exactly the right length, but it leaves mm -hmm. you wanting more. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're great. And, and you have this song, Revolution Lover, which um, you were saying earlier is you know, kind of gaining steam. And I mean, it sounds to me like this kind of love anthem kind of thing for love anthem for young people or something. I don't know how you would classify it, but I would definitely, I would definitely call it anthemic. Mm -hmm. That's like, I don't like to toot my own horn often. Mm -hmm. I still toot my own horn often, but like, <laughs> but you don't like to do it. I don't like to do it, but I gotta, you know, uh -huh. but like, um, one thing that I'm like really happy about is how anthemic Revolution Lover ended up being. Yeah. I feel like that was uh, that was a song that I needed to hear mm. more. Like, cause I wrote it for Zoe, who needed to hear the phrase "We'll be all right" in our current political climate. Mm. And so, writing it made me realize I was also writing the song for myself. I was writing the song for both of us. And a lot of people like have interpreted it as just a general, as just a general we, which I think is the best misinterpretation of that song. And I've kind of adapted it as the new meaning of the song. Yeah. Even though it says the phrase, I know we both could have almost died, but I think like, I think the song is less me speaking to my partner and it's instead me speaking to whoever's listening and i think that's a really important distinction to make because i when i was writing the song i didn't expect it to be like taken that way and the fact that it has been taken that way is like really important for a lot of people i've had one person messaged me um, that I had literally saved their life mm -hmm. because of that song. And I think I mentioned it before in an interview, so I won't talk about it too much, but essentially um, 
like they were just listening to it all um, after they were admitted to the hospital mm. uh, for a suicide attempt, mm. from what I can tell. And they just kept on repeating that chorus to themselves. Wow. And that was enough to keep them going. And that was really important to me because that was kind of like the moment where I was like, this song is not just for me and Zoe. This song is for everybody that needs to hear it. It was an intense experience and I'm still like processing it to this day yeah. because like I wasn't able to be there to experience that. I wasn't able to like understand what they were going through. Uh, I mean, I can pick apart like how I felt in those scenarios when I've been like this close and, but that's my experience. That's not theirs. So, I think the thing that I take away from the experience of writing Revolution Lover and releasing it and having the, the impact sort of like come to me is just like a real solid reminder of like what type of responsibility I do have. Mm. Um, it is beyond just making music that's good. To some people, they see me as a role model. And that, I forget that a lot of the time. Mm. It's really weird because like, it's really weird that people see me as a role model. I like it and I'm really thankful for it. And I feel like I trust myself to be a good role model for, for others. Mm. But at the same time, I tweeted the phrase pee pee poo poo yesterday. And I'm like, this, this is your role model? <laughs> this? You seem um, maybe surprisingly comfortable in that role. Where, I mean, I think it's great that you're embracing that because you've sort of found yourself here, right? Yeah. And you're embracing that role. Where do you think that feeling of being comfortable comes from? I think it's the disconnect that the internet has, honestly. Cause like I do shows in Seattle and like, you know, a moderate amount of people show up, but then I go on like my Twitter DMs and like somebody tells me like, hey, you're the reason that I came out to my mom today. And I'm like, okay, mm. <laughs> like, okay. How much, how much do you really take that on? Like, do you, do you fall asleep at night thinking about that kid that DM'd you? Um, I think about, I don't think about the people, like there have been a lot of people that, in my, that have been in my mentions that have said like, hey, you're the reason that you, like, I've came out to my family or something like that. And I'm really grateful for them. Uh, and I think about them a lot, but I don't think about them as much as I do that one person who DM'd me about Revolution Lover. Yeah. And I think the reason why is because that like, that was sort of like, okay, this is more than the music. This is way more than the music. I'm not doing music anymore for the sake of the music. I, music is the hobby. Um, being somebody that people can look up to is the job, hmm. if that makes sense. Hmm. And I, <laughs> I just hope that I'm doing a good job of it. I'm sure you are. Thank you. I'm sure you are. Um, let's leave it at that. Huh? Nat Puff, go. thanks for coming through. Absolutely. Absolutely.